We're on the air with another edition of Patius on the News. We're delighted tonight to have a very prominent Maine Republican on the show with us, Kevin Ray from Eastport, Maine, a uh, well-known political figure in, in Maine. Uh, he was uh, for a long time chief of staff for Senator Olympia Snow. He was in the Maine Senate for many years, president of the main Senate, the Republican leader of the main Senate uh, during the first two years of the Paul LePage administration. Uh, he's, as I say, a native of Eastport, uh, lives there, lives in the town of Perry near Eastport now, graduate of Bates College and runs a business uh, called Ray's Mustard. I call it Ray's Famous Mustard because it is. Kevin, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me, Harold. Let me ask you a question about Ray's mustard. I actually had been to the mustard mill. Uh, years ago, I was up there with, uh, with a fellow uh, that ran, ran the main times, and uh, we spent the night with a fellow named Harry Richardson. Did you know who Harry Richardson was? Oh, I there? sure did. Very well, yes. And we, hit, we stayed at his uh, camp, but we went over and visited Ray's Mustard Mill. And uh, I'll never forget that. Now, you're the CEO of uh, Ray's Mustard now, correct? Yeah, my wife Karen and I uh, uh, bought the mill from my cousin uh, back in 2005. Uh, it's been in my family. We're the fourth generation of Rays to uh, own and operate the mill. It's been uh, making mustard uh, in Eastport since 1900 and in this particular facility since 1903. Wow. Wow. That's great. How to hold on to a family business. I like that story. Yeah, so it's great. It's a great story. We're very proud of it. We've got a great crew. Uh, my wife is at the business day to day. Uh, as I'm uh, selling real estate as well, but uh, we have a wonderful crew and we're very proud of them and the product we put out. This isn't the main topic of this show, but it might be interested, interesting for our listeners to hear you talk a little bit about real estate. You know, you're a well-known uh, real estate uh, person in, in Washington County uh, and uh, things have changed because of the pandemic and real estate and demand for real estate and who's living in the county. Is that correct? Yeah, vastly. Uh, we've seen uh, really this year, 2020, uh, as a result of the pandemic, we've seen uh, a huge uh, upswing in terms of real estate sales um, with people coming to Washington County, uh, to some to live full time, some to have second homes. And they're coming from uh, everywhere. They're coming from uh, Southern Maine. They're coming from other New England states. And they're coming from, from other states. We're seeing uh, new residents from California and Colorado uh, and Oregon and Florida and Texas and just really everywhere. Uh, and I think it's something we're seeing repeated uh, throughout rural parts of Maine as people are looking for, um, I think, uh, a place that they feel where they feel safe uh, and a slower pace of life. We're also seeing as a result of people being able to work remotely um, in the face of the, and the aftermath of the pandemic an upswing in terms of younger families who are moving to rural Maine, which is a very welcome uh, development. Is, and is that, is, does that mean that in some towns in Washington County, the school population is actually growing? Yeah, I've, I've sold a number of properties to uh, young families where uh, one or both 
uh, spouses are working remotely. Um, and uh, some of those uh, folks have kids. And so it, it, I think it will and is resulting in an uptick uh, in terms of the school age population, which is very, very welcome in rural Maine. So one of the things that I want to uh, talk about is the two parties, Republican and Democratic Party, and uh, the movements within these parties and how they're realigning. And I think it is true there is a realignment uh, of the parties. And let's start with Washington County, where you are, and where you have a good deal of expertise. And I ought to uh, mention to our audience that um, not only were you state senator and president of the Maine State Senate, uh, but you have been a candidate uh, two or three times uh, for Congress. And um, so you're very familiar with the demographics and the dynamics, political dynamics of the second district. Now, I remember I was the Democratic state chairman 50 years ago. And I, I remember um, a time when the St. John Valley was solid uh, Democrat, that places like Millinocket, East Millinocket were uh, Democratic towns. Uh, and the Democrats did pretty well in the second district. That's all changed. They can't come close now. Uh, why is that? Well, I think that it's certainly that some of the towns that you mentioned, we've seen a sea change uh, because of the changes in the paper industry. I think the obviously the labor unions uh, were a very uh, powerful force uh, when the paper companies dominated the economy across the second district. Uh, and particularly the mill towns, the votes from the mill towns would come in uh, and Republicans would be hoping that they might get, uh, you know, 25 or 30 percent in those towns uh, to be able to try to cobble together uh, a win district wide. Um, but with the with the demise of so many of the paper mills, that that has vastly changed. And I think you see um, now really some of the driving uh, dynamics in the second district are the dynamics you see at play across rural districts all over the country. Um, and in many respects, uh, the parties have become uh, sort of an, has been an urban rural split with many rural areas becoming more Republican, many urban areas and suburban areas becoming more democratic. And, and certainly second district is a rural district, so it would be reflective of that. I think the, the second amendment is a big driver, a huge issue uh, in the second district that cuts the Republicans way generally. Uh, that you see Jared Golden as the congressman in the second district who has a, a profile um, as being you know, pro second amendment. I think that's not a coincidence that he's been able to put together a majority taking that tact. I think also within the Republican party you've seen uh, the uh, the role of evangelical churches uh, and social conservatism has become much more uh, uh, prevalent, and uh, you see that at play in Republican primaries. That's uh, you see it in Republican primaries, and I, that that uh, leads me to another observation. Uh, you're a very brave man because you've run in Republican congressional primaries in the second district as a pro-life, I mean, as a, as a pro-choice politician. Uh, that's a very gutsy thing to do. Uh, it, did you get a lot of pushback from Republicans about your position uh, uh, on abortion? Well, you know, I think the, the, the position that I always took is certainly not pro-abortion, but it's, it's pro-choice. Um, which, because I've always believed that too much government interference in, in one's personal life is not a good thing. And I thought that, I've always thought of that as a very basic Republican principle. Barry Goldwater uh, was uh, pro-gun and pro-choice. And uh, that's, that's where I always found myself. Not that I'm in favor of abortion, but that I'm very uncomfortable with government being intrusive enough and large enough to insert itself into that profoundly personal matter of health and faith 
uh, is, which made me uncomfortable. Now, when I was in the Maine Senate, uh, the Republican caucus was roughly 50-50 uh, in terms of uh, pro-life Republicans and pro-choice Republicans. Uh, I think, I haven't looked uh, lately, but I suspect it's, it's uh, much more pro-life now than it was when I was there. But uh, it certainly was not out of the mainstream uh, in my time in politics, um, you know, certainly uh, Bill Cohen, uh, Olympia Snow, Jock McKernan, Susan Collins, uh, all successful Republican figures in Maine uh, have had that same profile. And, and that's uh, 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 a lot of libertarians are pro-choice too. They don't want the government uh, telling people what they do in their private lives. Uh, uh, so that's a, a very good explanation. But I'll bet that explanation isn't good enough for a lot of the evangelicals in the second district uh, because this is a very important issue for them and how you come down on that issue is uh, what counts. You yeah, I mean, you certainly, you certainly saw that, you know, uh, I, I ran for Congress uh, three times over the course of, uh, I guess, 14, 12 or 14 years. Um, and uh, twice uh, won Republican primaries uh, uh, as a as a pro-choice, pro-gun Republican, uh, and in the last time uh, lost a primary to Bruce Poliquin, uh, which uh, on which he focused primarily on those social uh, social sort of hot button issues. So I think you saw over time the party. Um, shifting to the right um, as uh, the base became more conservative. And that's certainly something that was reflected um, uh, with uh, the, the Trump era. So explain to me why in Washington County, Eastport, for instance, went for Biden very strongly, in fact, mm -hmm. and hardly any other place in Washington County did. I mean, I looked at Cherryfield, down Route 1 from uh, Eastport. And uh, Cherryfield, two thirds of the voters voted for Trump, which is not surprising because in the county, Trump got nearly 60% of the vote. So what's the difference in the demographics between Cherryfield and Eastport? Well, Eastport has always been more, uh, more democratic uh, in, in terms of, if, if you look at the county, uh, when when a Democrat uh, can win or uh, get elected, um, Eastport and Lubeck are almost always part of the equation uh, because they are more democratic. Um, also, the uh, Passamaquoddy tribal reservations are are heavily democratic. So, you know, we do have I think currently our legislative delegation from Washington County um, has at least two Democrats. Um, in it. Um, when I was there, uh, Washington County has been over the years back and forth between the two parties actually. Uh, when I first ran for the legislature in 2004, ran for the Senate, uh, Washington County had a Republican senator and five Democratic House members. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we worked on that and by the time I left office, we had an all Republican uh, delegation all House members uh, plus the Senate seat. Uh, it's now kind of gone back, and I think there are, I know there are at least two members of the delegation from Washington County who are Democratic. So there are differences from town to town and community to community. But the people are all, I'm trying to, are the differences in who the voters are? For, for instance, uh, I think the fishermen uh, this time around were all for Trump, uh, at least I got that impression. Uh, but they're all doing basically the same jobs. I mean, it isn't, it isn't like the difference between uh, Falmouth and Eastport. Uh, and so they basically have the same jobs. They're basically in the same socioeconomic range. Uh, and some say, okay, I want Trump to be president. And these people in Eastport and Lubeck say, oh, no, we're, we're free. is it just habit? Well, I think there there are several things uh, at play. You know, esports an interesting, um, eclectic uh, mix of, of people. 
Uh, we have, you know, we're a traditional fishing village. We have a large uh, number of people who make their living on the water. Uh, and we also have uh, a fairly large population of uh, people who have bought homes and moved in, uh, who are retirees or, or near retirement. Um, and we have a large uh, arts community in Eastport. So I think this has been generally the case over the years that Eastport has been among the more democratic leaning towns, uh, or, or Eastport's actually a city, main smallest city, uh, but one of the more democratic leaning communities. And the same is true of Lubeck. Uh, and it had been true in the past of Baileyville, where the Woodland Mill is located. Uh, but much like uh, other towns, including uh, uh, East Millinocket and Lincoln and other mill towns, uh, the influence of the labor unions has diminished there. And uh, Baileyville now uh, often is in the Republican column. So you also uh, were obviously a big supporter of Susan Collins. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And so you did, did you uh, get involved in the last camp this past campaign? Yes, I was one of her uh, county co-chairs uh, for Washington County. Um, I appeared in uh, I, I guess two or three of her uh, television ads, um, and I certainly I penned uh, op-eds um, on uh, Senator Collins. And I felt from the outset that she was being uh, unfairly uh, maligned. Uh, and that her long uh, proven record of uh, centrism and bipartisan leadership uh, was being uh, really ignored <laughs> at a time when I felt it's really more important than ever because there are so, so few voices left in Washington who are willing to engage in constructive, respectful, civil, uh, bipartisan work. And frankly, that's where all the issues get resolved. And uh, I was, I was very, I felt very, very strongly that we needed to keep her uh, at work and keep her constructive presence in Washington. Um, and I was very worried about uh, how she would fare because I could see what was happening statewide in terms of uh, the, the Biden Trump campaign. Uh, but I was in the unique position that I was a Republican who publicly endorsed Joe Biden because of my discomfort uh, with President Trump and how he has conducted himself uh, in office. Uh, but I was strongly in Susan's camp. So on election day, I was probably one of those uh, rare prognosticators who was very happy <laughs> uh, because they both won. I, I don't think you were so rare, uh, actually, Kevin, <laughs> because uh, Susan Collins won handily and Joe Biden won handily. And I, I guess you could deduce that yes they both succeeded because they had Kevin Ray in their camp. <laughs> I don't think that was it. <laughs> but, uh, but um, uh, one of the things one, one of the dynamics in that uh, uh, Collins campaign was there have always been a lot of Democrats who voted for Susan Collins. They're also worried many Democrats thought Trump was going to win. I mean, it's just, they just think, how does he do it? He does it. Uh, there's a movement in America and he's going to win. And the idea of Mitch McConnell and Trump together running the show, I think was an issue. In the end, it wasn't an issue for Susan Collins. I mean, she still got a lot of Democratic votes, had to. She did well in the first district. Yes. So uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, course of events during the fall, and she had uh, people who were so strong that people were upset about the Supreme Court appointment and so forth, and and they were so upset, mad at her, that I thought she couldn't win. And the polls, which we know are wrong, uh, showed her with a very high unfavorability. She used to have the lowest unfavorability, or put it another way, the most favor highest favorability rating of any United States Senator. And then it reversed. It reversed and said, so how is she gonna overcome that? But she did, I think Bill Green's ads did a lot too. I agree, I agree. I think, I think in the end, 
Um, I, I was watching the, in that race, I was watching the undecided. Um, and my observation had been in those final weeks, given the unprecedented uh, level of attacks uh, against Susan, uh, literally, my wife counted a cu couple different times we were watching the evening news. Uh, during one commercial break, there were five ads. Just in one commercial break, five ads attacking Susan from all different. All Is different it, let me let me interrupt for a second. During that same break, were there any ads attacking Gideon? No, no. And this, uh, these, this particular the, twice watching the news in the I don't know final few weeks. Um, Karen said, "When the when the ads start, I'm going to see. I'm going to count." It will, it will, one night when she did, there were five ads attacking Susan. Uh, there were no ads uh, in, in favor of Susan in that particular uh, segment. Uh, but it was, it was unprecedented. Granted, lots of ads on both sides, but the attack ads against Susan just seemed to be uh, outnumber anything. And I think they, they did. Um, and I kept watching that undecided because uh, my observation was, okay, we've been watching attack ads against Susan for a year. If voters, if there are voters who remain undecided, it means they are having trouble buying the attacks against Susan. They are troubled by it. They're confused by it, but they haven't bought it. And when I, when we got to the end and they, that I said to Karen, I said, I believe the undecideds are going to break for Susan because I think they've been, they've been pummeled with this message for a year and they haven't bought it yet, it means they're not gonna buy it. And I think that is what happened. I think the polling showed that the undecideds did break for Susan at the end because they decided that uh, they really didn't believe these attacks against her. They thought they knew her. They felt they knew her from watching her all these years. And you know, <laughs> the other thing that really I think helped save her is something that helped save Olympia Snow in 1990 when she had a really close call and Olympia said it to me many times over the years, the fact that um, her office, her staff has been there, same with Susan, has helped so many people over the years. The casework that Susan Collins' office does has, has just touched thousands and thousands of lives across the state. And I think that that made a difference for her too. Uh, I would agree with you. And I would uh, add one other thing. Both sides, look, this was a national campaign in, for the Senate seat made. And uh, both sides uh, used negative advertising. Both sides used negative advertising. Mm -hmm. But uh, the difference is that negative advertising is supposed to be, the purpose of negative advertising is to define your opponent, to define them, to draw a picture of your opponent. So the National Democratic Party came into Maine and all this negative ad to define Susan Collins, who needs no defining. People knew her. You mentioned it. People know Senator Collins. So the negative advertising wasn't very effective. On the other hand, people knew nothing about Gideon. So the, any negative advertising about her, people said, well, I didn't know that. So there is a difference. And... I think the, the National Democratic Party uh, did a terrible, terrible job in that campaign. On the other hand, uh, as a Democrat, I will observe that uh, I thought Trump was going to win, and that's, that did worry me, uh, because I don't like this circling the wagons around Trump and essentially giving him the signal, do whatever you want to do. Do whatever you want to do. You're not going to have a problem with us. Uh, so... But now, with a Democratic president, I think Susan Collins can be perhaps the most influential United States senator in Washington. And yeah, the fact particularly given the fact that the uh, particularly given the fact that the Senate's going to be so closely divided, whichever way yeah. it falls after the Georgia elections, uh, yeah. Susan's going to be pivotal. No question, no question uh, about it. And uh, she and Joe Manchin and. Uh, Lisa Murkowski uh, and maybe Mitt Romney from really decide wh what direction this country is going to go. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, that uh, Susan Collins is uh, 
part of that group. And she's also going to be powerful because she may be pre she may be chairman of, of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Isn't that true? Yeah, I think before this term is over, uh, she won't be in this in the in the upcoming Senate. But I believe yeah. that by the next Senate, uh, she is in line to to chair the Appropriations Committee, and that that her her position on that committee has already been enormously important to Maine. But clearly, if she chairs the Senate Appropriations Committee, uh, that puts her in just a whole new position of influence and and power nationally, and that can only accrue to the benefit of Maine. So you made reference uh, a few minutes ago to an op-ed piece that uh, you wrote, you and uh, another Republican, uh, former Republican Senator Roger Cates of Augusta, yes. wrote a, a, a joint piece uh, endorsing Biden. And his, uh, uh, what you said leads me to ask some questions about demographics and about voters. Okay. So we talked a bit about Trump's popularity in the second district. And you and your fellow Republican Roger Cates said Trump lacks honesty. You think that all those that 60% of the people in, in uh, Washington County who voted for Trump think he's honest? Well, it's interesting. I have, uh, it won't surprise you, uh, that I have uh, many uh, close friends. I have many family members uh, who uh, voted for Donald Trump. And what I hear many of them uh, say is an acknowledgement of his flaws, of his personal flaws, uh, almost to a person they don't like his tweets. Um, they find uh, some of the things that he says, uh, things that they sort of roll their eyes at, and well, there he goes again. Uh, but they like his policies. And they believe that, um, I think, because he is so blunt and abrasive, I think for many people, they interpret that as being honest and straightforward. Um, I find it blunt and abrasive, but I certainly don't find it honest and straightforward because I've seen too many times that uh, the president will make a statement and uh, he, he, he no sooner comes out of his mouth when somebody astonished says, well, you just said, uh, and repeat what he says, and he'll say, I didn't say that. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's, it's astonishing to me. I mean, his, to me, his, his lack of uh, honesty is evident and is, is proven virtually every time he speaks. But many people who have been so cynical about politics and politicians they say, well, you know what? They're all dishonest, uh, but, but he, at least he's blunt about it. Uh, I, there, there are a lot of excuses made uh, as to why it's okay that he acts in the way he does and says the things he does. One of the, one of the things that's repeated most often to me is, well, he's not a politician, uh, as if it's somehow a, a matter of, of pride that someone can be rude and abrasive and dishonest as long as they're not a politician. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's also an element that I see and hear in people's explanations. They like the idea that uh, Donald Trump, you know, sticks it to the man. But I often try to remind them he is the man. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really understand uh, how, how that can be attractive to people. But I, I respect the fact that it is. And... Um, I just, I know so many people who I care about, who I like and respect, who do like him, uh, that I can't Well, well wait a minute, wait a minute. Just say, like him, mm -hmm. and there's something else. But I'm, I'm not sure what you've told us is that they like him. True, you know, yeah, true. They, I guess you could say that. a likable character. Yeah, yeah, I think often people will acknowledge that he's not entirely likable on a personal level, but they like his presidency. They like his... They like his policy positions. They like his brashness sometimes. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a hard thing for me to explain, honestly, because I don't thoroughly understand it, uh, because I just find him uh, so objectionable in terms of how he treats people. He sort of is the opposite of everything I believe about uh, how politics should work and, and, and what I practiced when I was in political office 
you know, I always believed that uh, my Democratic counterparts who were elected to come to Augusta to work with me uh, had just as much um, love for the state of Maine and uh, love for its people as I did. Uh, they just had a different way of approaching it and different views. And I always found that we could work respectfully. We could find areas of common ground. We'd find some areas where we agreed to disagree. But even when that was the case, we could do it without being disagreeable. And um, to me, Donald Trump has been, has epitomized the opposite of that. He casts everything in terms of, uh, you know, a battle and he refers to people who disagree with him as, a, as being enemies of the people. Uh, and I just find all of that uh, dangerous and appalling and unnecessarily divisive, and playing in exactly into the hands of Vladimir Putin and other adversaries of this country who want America weakened by division. The, uh... It's interesting. Uh, I run into people all the time who say, you know, uh, I don't, I, 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 I object. I, I, I find him to be an objectionable person, human being, the way he acts, uh, his sense, of, his lack of integrity, empathy, all of that. But I like what he does. And so we hear that constantly. And I hear it all the time from people who, uh, who supported uh, Trump. And it reminds me of a dinner party I went to two years ago of some fairly well-known out-of-state Republicans. One has a home here in Cape Elizabeth and a, a, and a Fox News, very prominent Fox News reporter was there. It was just eight of us or 10 of us at dinner at this guy's house. And they said, this was two years ago. Well, I don't like that. He, he, I find him to be an objectionable personality, but I like what he's do, what he's doing, and they all said the same thing. Every one of them. Uh, there I was, you know. I <laughs> I didn't want to get in an argument with anybody, so I kind of stayed out of it. But then, I ended it, and I said, do you, "What you mean is he delivers? You like what he delivers?" Every one of them said yes, and I said, "Well, so did Hitler. I mean, he delivered." Look, Hitler's popularity was enormous, not in the beginning when he became chancellor, but five years later when they had taken the Sudetenland, were getting ready to invade Poland, greater Germany, making Germany great again, made Adolf Hitler a very popular man. But nobody could say, oh, I love the guy. He's a lovable fellow. Uh, or I, you know, but they, they, they liked him. So... It's true. And the other thing, I ask you about this. Uh, they like what he's done. Now, many places in rural Maine, lowering taxes is not a big thing for the people. I mean, to, 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 to lower the taxes of somebody who's lost their job at a mill, doesn't have a mill to go to, who lived pretty well before, but doesn't. What is lowering taxes and 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 capital gains do for them? Nothing. Well, the, the thing, you, one of the things that uh, I've often heard about Trump, he talked a lot about bringing jobs back to America. You know, that was one of his mantras, that he was going to bring back uh, manufacturing and restore the American dream. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I think have played to uh, people in the second district where we had such a negative impact by, from NAFTA. But one of the things I wanted to point out, listening to what you were just talking about, is what I think the 2020 election showed is that in, in the same way that you said so many people like what Trump uh, delivered, look what happened. The Republican Party, which uh, is really reflective of some of those issues, fared very well in 2020. Republican Party gained seats in the U.S. Congress, kept uh, losses, which had been predicted to be huge, kept losses, I think, to one seat so far in the U.S. Senate. But at the same time that Republicans were doing quite well, Donald Trump was rejected 
uh, with a significant margin nationally. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is reflective of the fact that the nation has become uh, more conservative, more leaning Republican, but there were enough people who otherwise voted Republican who found Donald Trump's leadership to be repugnant and rejected him. And it's one of the reasons that he's crying foul running around the country saying the election had to have been rigged because how could it be that Republicans were successful, Republicans were winning here, there, and everywhere, yet I lost. Well, uh, I would submit it was a very uh, uh, personal rejection of Donald Trump that resulted in not Republican losses, but Donald Trump's loss. Uh, and uh, I think that there are a lot of people like me, I'm in a lifelong Republican. I was a Republican when I was uh, less than 10 years old on the playground uh, running around. I can remember wearing a Jim Irwin button uh, when I was an elementary school student. And uh, I dragged my friends on their 18th birthday. Any number of my high school friends can tell you I dragged them to City Hall to register to vote and become Republicans. I have, I have eat, slept, and breathed Republican politics uh, my, my entire life. But I could not countenance uh, Donald Trump and what I felt he was doing to the soul of the country and the divisiveness and the bitterness, which I find so dangerous uh, for the future of the union. And I, 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 I truly mean that. And I think that there were enough people like me across the country who did not reject uh, Republican policies uh, or uh, you know, the Republican stands on many issues, but who just could not uh, support Donald Trump, uh, given the type of leadership he's shown, and particularly in the pandemic, the way he has been dismissive uh, and asleep at the switch with regard to the pandemic, causing America to suffer worse than virtually any other country on the planet, uh, was a complete abdication of leadership. And I think that also had a lot to do with why he was rejected. I listened to uh, a guy on Zoom who I've met before, who is a very prominent national political analyst and poster and so forth. And he said after the election, I was listening to him and he said uh, that he was on a Zoom call with uh, four or five others, including a Republican congressman from Louisiana, who's a friend of his. And he said the Republican congressman put it the best as to what happened, a rejection of Donald Trump, not of the Republican party. And he said that there are two takeaways from these election results. One is don't be a jerk. And the other is don't be a socialist. Those are the two takeaways. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I do think that, you know, I do think that some of the uh, harsh uh, left-wing rhetoric from, from, the, from the left of the Democratic Party was like an albatross uh, around the necks of many candidates. Uh, I think the, 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 the term socialism, I think one of the things that just was an absolute uh, disaster for Democrats this year was defund the police. What anybody was thinking, even in the far left of the Democratic Party, to coin such a phrase, that was, that was a gift. That was a gift to Republicans. Uh, because it was so completely tone deaf uh, in terms of, you know, allowing uh, uh, the, the, the fears of many people across the country to be, to be realized. It was, that was just nuts. You're right. Socialism, socialism and uh, defunding the police uh, were the two probably biggest albatrosses around the necks of Democrats. As a former Democratic state chairman, I want to tell you, I agree with you, not 99%, 100%. You are right on. And I was talking to my friend George Mitchell three or four days ago, and he said, Harold, you remember in the days when if somebody accused a Democrat of being a socialist, they'd deny it. They said, no, 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 please, I'm not a, I'm not a, a socialist. Now, he says, we got Democratic politicians who brag about it.
and say, yes, I'm a socialist. He says, look at, look at Bernie. He's not even a Democrat. He says he's a socialist. He's not a Democrat. He has a huge following. So you're, you're absolutely right. That made a big difference in the, in, in this election, I think. And, it did. And I'll, yeah, one of the other things I'll say is that I observing the Democratic presidential uh, primary process, um, it, it, it looked to me like it was a fight uh, between, you know, Bernie, who wanted to literally remake the Democratic Party into a socialist party, versus Biden, who reflected to me a more traditional uh, much more centrist uh, uh, version of the Democratic Party. And I think it was the, I, I told people, my Democratic friends, I said, if Biden wins the primary and becomes a Democratic nominee, I will support him. Many of them were incredulous, said, you won't. I said, yes, I will. <laughs> and, uh, but, but literally, I mean, if it had been Bernie, I couldn't have done that. Nope. I just, I would have had to have just, uh, you know, uh, walked away and, and see what happened because I couldn't have been involved in supporting uh, Bernie. But, but Joe Biden uh, is no socialist. Uh, Joe Biden, uh, uh, there's, there's nothing to be uh, afraid of with Joe Biden. He has shown himself, and, and I know from my experience as Olympia's chief of staff in Washington, Joe Biden uh, is a middle of the road, reasonable person who can work well with Republicans uh, and I think help heal the divisions that have been so inflamed by Donald Trump over the years. Donald Trump did not invent the divisions that are, are so prevalent in America, but he played to them and he encouraged them. He found them to be helpful to his uh, political um, uh, whims. And that's not Joe Biden. Joe Biden uh, while I will not agree with him on every policy, I'm certain of it. Um, I, I know that he uh, does not view Republicans uh, as the enemy of the people. And we need to move past this whole enemy of the people thing uh, because we're all Americans. We have different points of view. But I grew up in a house with a Democratic father who was the Democratic town chairman when I was a little boy and a Republican mother. So I knew the Democrats and Republicans can coexist peacefully. And uh, I've always believed it, and I hope we get back to it. Uh, you, Kevin, that reminds me of a, of, uh, of a story. I had the uh, great honor to uh, work in the White House, and I accompanied, uh, uh, well, I actually went to, in July 65, to uh, the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, to meet with President Truman. Uh, in retirement there, the day before my boss, Lyndon Johnson, was coming to Independence to sign the Medicare Act uh, uh, at, the, at the Truman Library. And so when I was, I got there in the afternoon, the day before, and to, uh, Truman's secretary said to me, well, the president has gone home to take a nap, but when he comes back at four o'clock, he'd like to meet you. So I showed up at four o'clock and it was just the two of us for about an hour. Wow. Harry Truman and me, and Harry Truman was his uh, office uh, window faced into a courtyard, and he had his chair turned a lot of the time, just gazing into the courtyard and chatting with me. And toward the end of our meeting, I said, uh, Mr. President, and he was gazing out the window, so his, his side was to me. I was sitting on the side of his desk, uh, uh, a chair on the side of his desk. And he's gazing out the window, and I said, Mr. President, my mother is a lifelong Republican, and she believes you're the greatest president of her lifetime. And with that, he slowly turned his chair to face me on the side. And he said, your mother said that? And I said, yes, sir. And she'd like to have an autographed picture from you. <laughs> he said, uh, young man, let me tell you something. Mothers are always right. <laughs> <laughs> and That's a great story. What a great opportunity to meet Henry Truman. That's great. Oh, yeah. It was terrific. It, it, incidentally, I'll just add, that was for the signing of the Medicare Act. It was signed in, in his presence because he first proposed it in 1947. It was 
it was uh, defeated. Now, of course, uh, and everybody said, you know, it's socialism, it's this and that, but most people like it. I'm on it. I like it. But uh, in, in any event, let me let me let me turn. Uh, we're running out of time. Let, let me turn to the Republican Party. The Democratic Party is going to have this battle between middle of the roaders like me, moderates like me, and and the left, uh, the cutting edge left. And I believe in certain things. You know, I believe in. I, I, I maybe this is a leftist view. But I believe that everybody who will do the work, can do the work in college, should get a college education, everyone. And financial obstacles should not be the difference. I believe that everybody who needs uh, a way to pay for health care should have a way to pay for health care. I, I, I don't regard those as radical positions, but I understand some people say, well, that's what the left-wing Democrats say. However, I am a middle of the roader, and I am, I, am, I am a moderate, and I think the Democrats are in for a big battle. Having said that, I'm going to ask you about this. I think the Republicans have their own battle because I think, and I'll give Donald, credit, Donald Trump credit for this. He's done something remarkable. He has taken over himself the Republican Party. He's absolutely taken it over. He has, it's a movement, and he has these fervent, fervent followers, devoted followers. And I use the word follower advisedly. They are followers. It's a movement. And um, I don't know what the Republicans could do about this. If you want to run for president, if you're a Republican and you want to run for president next time, he's your opponent. He's going to make sure you don't get very far. So... What do you think about that? How, what's going to happen to the Republicans? How are they going to avoid being the Trumpist party and become again the Republican party? Well, I think it's going to take a period of recovery. I think that clearly right now the Republican party is the Trumpist party. And uh, I think that's been something that's made a great deal of us uh, very uncomfortable uh, because that is not the Republican party that I have uh, believed in and worked for over the years. Um, I think in, in the long run, uh, the party who is best able to appeal to the middle will win. In the presidential race, Joe Biden was better able to appeal to the middle, and he won, and he won a significant victory. I believe it's now over a 7 million vote margin. In the congressional races, the down ballot races, I believe in many respects, the Republican Party was better able to, to appeal to the, to the moderates, to the middle, because of the socialism, uh, because of the, you know, defund the police. Those kinds of things just absolutely made it very difficult for a lot of Democrats to cut through to reach the, the moderate voters in the middle. So you saw the moderates split their tickets. You saw, you know, you saw uh, here in Maine, for example, you saw Biden winning convincingly while Susan Collins won consistently because they were able to reach the middle. And in the long run, that's who's going to win. Um, and so I think both parties uh, need to be mindful of uh, where they stand in terms of that ability to connect with the vast majority of people who are in the middle. And they can, people in the middle can accept center left and they can accept center right but they cannot accept the extremes of either one. Well said. I couldn't agree. I keep saying this to you. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. But I don't know how the center is going to hold in both these parties because um, we had a Republican primary in, in uh, presidential primaries in 2016. And there was the most radical guy, the guy that was that shocked everybody, who won easily. Mm -hmm. And the same thing was happening in the Democratic Party. I mean, with with Bernie, uh, the same thing that it was the extreme part of these parties, both sides, that put, that have the leverage in primaries. It, it you know I always say 
and I, I'll get a lot of mail or maybe on, on this, uh, that in the old days, the party leaders would get together in a smoke-filled room and say, who can win? Who can appeal to the middle? Who's our best candidate? But that doesn't happen anymore. So I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. There's a, there's a very conservative, well-known professor at Princeton University, my alma mater, who I, I listen to, I watch, I read his stuff. His name is Robert George, Bobby George. And he's one of the best known conservative thinkers in America. And um, Robert George says there is a realignment. Uh, it may not be a permanent realignment, but uh, as the result of Trump. And he said, um, it's the professional class, which is suburbanites, the professional class uh, who are kind of gravitated toward, uh, toward Biden and the blue collar uh, people who were the original Roosevelt Democrats who elected Roosevelt and Harry Truman in 48 and, and Kennedy, that those blue collar people have joined in the same party with, he says, the corporate class and there's an alliance. One is cultural. The working class people who are Republicans are Republicans for cultural reasons, not economic reasons. And the traditional corporate class Republicans, they're interested in economics. And he says that, that that's the realignment. Now, I don't know if it is or not, but it's, it's a thought. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's. I think it may be. I think it may be true. I think I was thinking about the Roosevelt Democrats, and and uh, you know many of them in the '80s became Reagan Democrats. Yes, they did. And I think that the difference between uh, Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump, there are many. Frankly, Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. could not win a Republican primary today uh, because of his views on immigrants, uh, for example. Yeah. Um, but. Ronald Reagan uh, was a true believer, true conservative. Um, but Ronald Reagan was all about optimism and lifting up the country. And Donald, and so Ronald Reagan was able to win a second term, winning 49 states. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Donald Trump uh, could not replicate that and was defeated because Donald Trump was never about optimism and lifting up the country. He was about division, about personal grievance, uh, about a victim mentality that did not generate the same broad and lasting appeal that Ronald Reagan did. So I think Reagan showed that the country uh, is, is willing to accept, you know, a conservative leader who makes them feel good, who, who, who understands uh, psychology and the importance of projecting optimism and uh, feeling good about the country and the future of the country, uh, as opposed to uh, a president who has, and even since the election, it's all about his own personal grievances. Uh, and there's a, there's a vast difference there. So I don't know about the staying power of the realignment that's underway um, in terms of whether or not the, you know, the, the, the Trump, the people who've been brought into the fold by Donald Trump, which has never been a majority. It's always been, I mean, he's, you know, generally... Uh, in the approval ratings and the, you know, does well to break into the low to mid 40s. Uh, I don't know if, about the staying power uh, of that. And particularly once Trump is gone, we don't know when Trump will be gone uh, because he's going to continue to be an influence uh, in the party that, that he has remade. But uh, I, I just don't know that it has staying power over the long term because I don't know that you can just uh, build a lasting party and with a future based on anger and division. You, uh, 
you you invoked Ronald Reagan, who whether you were for him or against him, whether uh, I didn't vote for him, but I acknowledge Ronald Reagan was a great president. He was a great president, one of the greatest presidents we've had, because he believed in certain things. They were beliefs. They were core beliefs of his, and he articulated them. And he was a great communicator, and he liked the American people, and he did what another great Republican president told us to do, to make an appeal to our better angels, said Lincoln in his second inaugural address. Appeal to our better angels. And Donald Trump was just the opposite, the absolute polar opposite. He said, it's a dump, and I'm going to save you from this dump that's in America. And people with grievances loved it, and they still love it, and they still believe what he says. Even when you pointed out uh, he says things one minute and two minutes later says something opposite and said, I didn't say it the first time. The difference is in America today, everybody has a video camera. And so we got them recorded. We can watch him saying these things and then watch him five minutes later saying, I didn't say it. Anyway. The, other thing that, the other thing that Abraham Lincoln uh, said, in, a, in addition to the better angels, is he talked about binding up America's wounds. Yes. And I think the big difference is that Donald Trump um, opened America's wounds. Uh, I think he saw it to his personal political benefit to exacerbate uh, and remind people of the wounds and to keep them bleeding. And that is, I think... Uh, in the final analysis, why he um, does not have the lasting appeal of uh, obviously an Abraham Lincoln or a Ronald Reagan. Kevin Ray, you are a very thoughtful guest and you have made a great contribution to our show by coming on and I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thank you.